Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. The optimist says we are what we love. The pessimist claims we are what we hate. The philosopher says perhaps we are a little of each. The idealist says there's a bit of good in the worst of us. The cynic insists there's a touch of evil in the best of us. All of which is just another way of saying that there are two sides to every story, especially the one you're about to hear. You're laughing at me. Oh, no. No. No one must ever laugh at me, do you understand? Oh, yes. Yes, sure. I won't tolerate it. And you're still doing it. No, no, I'm not. Look in the mirror. Do you see that grin? Look! Let let go of me, please! Look in the mirror. Let go! You're, You're... Please, please. I'll destroy that grin. I'll destroy it. Our mystery drama, Don't Play With Matches, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You can't tell the players without a scorecard, and you cannot distinguish the actors without the program. These problems, insofar as they arise at all, are easily solved in ballparks and theaters. However, what we might call the game of life is played on a bigger stage in a greater arena. And sometimes you can't tell who's who until it's too late. Consider Mr. Delbert Casserole. The healthiest thing a man can have is a hobby. Yes. We have to be taken out of ourselves. We have to try something different. Have a means of self-expression. Now, I have a job... A responsible job, and I perform it well. I enjoy it. But I can't wait for my day off. Then I'm my own man. I get into my car. I drive off somewhere. A change of scene. Another atmosphere. Sometimes I'll stop at a bar. Strike up a conversation with a stranger. No, 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 no. This one's on me, I insist. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you kindly. Uh... Parsons is the name. Peter Parsons. Well, I'm Jim Stacy. Oh. What uh, what business are you in, Mrs. Stacy? Well, I work for the city. Is that a fact? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm in the uh, newspaper game myself. I'm a foreign correspondent. Of course, you know my name isn't Peter Parsons. It's Delbert Casserole. And I'm not in the journalism game or anything even near it. But you see, when you go off by yourself, you have an opportunity to live many lives, to play a variety of roles, and it's no end of fun. Uh, Thank you kindly for the drink, Mr... uh... Parsons. uh, Peter Parsons. Ah, Parsons, Peter Parsons. (laughs) But I have to leave. I promised this friend of mine I'd... Uh, What did you say that your name was again? Uh, Stacy. Oh, a bartender? The same way. Now, just relax, Mr. Stacy. I've interviewed the crowned heads of Europe. Of course, you know, there aren't as many as there used to be. Nor of generals and statesmen and wheeler dealers of all makes and sizes. Well, I promised that they all had one thing in common, these great men. They all knew how to relax. Thank you, bartender. Now, Mr. Stacy, here you go. Relax and drink up. 
Well, this is this has got to be the last one. Ah, savor it, my friend. Savor it. Relish. Enjoy. Do you know what you're doing, Mr. Stacy? You are doing something for you. Hmm? You understand that? Uh, no. Something for you. Now, almost all of your time, all of your time and effort is devoted to the well-being of other people. Isn't that right? Your wife, children, and then you labor for the banker, the butcher, the grocer, the oil companies. And the list is endless. Now, you follow this? Well, I, uh... when you drink, when you eat... These are actions that are performed for you and for you alone. This is what you do for yourself, Mr. Stacy. Yes, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh... Parsons. Peter Parsons. Yes, but I really must be running. <laughs> Good night. Now the evening has begun, and I am properly primed. I'm intellectually stimulated. My mind is firing on all cylinders. So, I'm ready for a good dinner. I look for a fine eating place. A man should widen his outlook, broaden his tastes, as it were. And tonight I choose a Russian restaurant. Now, let me see. The cutlets Kiev or the shashlik? Uh, which do you recommend? They're both good, sir. Well, I must say that the one should be better. Would you agree? But they're both good. Oh, but all restaurants specialize. Now, the shashlik is Georgian. The cutlets Kiev are Ukrainian. Now tell me, where does the chef come from? Kiev or Tiflis? I, uh, I, I think he comes from Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> well, the menu is splendid. I haven't seen better even in Russia. Oh, you've been to Russia? Oh, many times. Many times. You see, uh, I'm a construction engineer. Oh? Uh, I I've never really known Russia. My folks brought me here when I was just a little kid. Oh, it's a beautiful country. Yes? I've built railroads in the snowy Euro Mountains, constructed dams in the Dunnitz Basin, oil refineries near the Black Sea city of Sevastopol in the Crimea. And on her face appears a look of wonder, mixed with admiration. I am someone unusual, someone out of the ordinary. I can see her eyes examining my expensive handmade suit, my custom tailored shirt. And the hard glance of appraisal dissolves into a soft look of invitation. My folks told me a great deal about the old country. No, I could tell you more. Oh, could you? Uh, well, when they close this place tonight, we might go somewhere that's quiet and comfortable, have a glass of wine, and talk about Russia. The motel is small. It might be considered somewhat seedy. But it's run by a sleepy-eyed desk clerk who doesn't ask a single question, doesn't look twice at the phony information you inscribe in the register, and wastes no time taking your money and handing you your room key. I don't even know your name. Well, I don't know yours either. Anya. Anya Petrov. That's what my parents gave me. I call myself Anna Peters. Mm-hmm. Well, uh... My name is, uh, Woodrow Wilson. What? That sounds familiar. Yes, I'm named after President Woodrow Wilson. Oh. But we're distantly related. Our family name is Wilson, so Woodrow comes quite naturally. Oh, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? I mean, he was one of those World War One-ish presidents, wasn't he? Yes. W Woodrow, I hope you don't think I do this all the time. Do what? This go to a motel with a man I just met. There's just something about you so different. Different? Oh. I don't know. I just feel you're an unusual person. That even what you're doing now is something serious and important to you. It is, isn't it? Yes. I'm very serious. Oh. And I'm very lonesome. Oh, I don't see why. No. No, it's more than lonesome. I'm lonely. Do you know what it is to be lonely? I don't see why you should be lonely. You're a very beautiful woman. Oh, yes. Yeah, there are plenty of men who'd want to be with me. But you're the first one, the only one, who ever made me feel important. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Oh, Woodrow, hold me. Kiss me. All I wanted was to take her in my arms. And then, 
then as I kissed her, there was a feeling of... There was a feeling of... Let me make sure that I say this right. There was a feeling of nothing. I felt nothing. A moment before, my heart had been pounding, my pulse racing, and now suddenly, without warning, the excitement was ended. As if the frantic desire that had been surging within me had either died or disappeared. And then... Then did I hear a laugh. A low, mocking laugh. What are you laughing at? I, I, I'm not laughing. Yes, you are. All right. I'm laughing. Why are you laughing? Oh, it's better than crying. Now, cut that out. I'm sorry. Well, well what's so funny? Oh, well, I guess nothing. Then why did you laugh? Oh, well, I said I was sorry. I want to go home. Why? We shouldn't have come here. Why? You shouldn't have asked me. Because I'm somebody you can laugh at, is that it? Please, I want You'll to go home. You'll be sorry you laughed at me. You, you don't have to take me home. I, I can get a cab. You're laughing at me. No, no, I'm not. I can hear it in your voice. I swear that you I'm You have not. that grin on your face. I don't. Look in the mirror. Please, let go of me. Turn your head. Please. Turn your head and look in the mirror. Let go of me. You see that grin uh, like an obscene, uh, filthy little rat? Let go of take me. Take that grin off your face. Take it off. Oh, I'll teach you to laugh at me. I'll teach you. Vanishes from her mouth. Her eyes bulge. A look of horror contorts her face. A shudder wrecks her body. And now she becomes limp. I take my hands away from my throat and she slides noiselessly to the floor. I leave the room, close the door behind me. There's no one in sight. I get into my car, back out of the parking lot, into the highway. I floor the accelerator until the needle reads 90. The night is cold, the sky is clear, the air is crisp. I thrill to the chill of the wind that sweeps over me. I am at peace. Because I know now what it is I must do to find fulfillment. Up ahead, about a hundred yards, I see the lights of a gas station. I pull over to the side of the road and I get out of the car. I approach the station on foot. Can you help me? Uh, I ran out of gas a couple of miles down the road. I can give you a couple of gallons in a can. How many gallons that can hold? Five. Well, you might as well fill it up. Be heavy to carry. No, I don't mind. <laughs> I'd give you a lift, but the kid's out with the tow truck. Oh, that's perfectly all right. If you're just a couple of miles down the road, you don't need five gallons to get back here. Well, uh, once bitten, twice shy. I just don't want to run dry again. Okay. Five years. Very good. Now, what about will you? That's two seventy for the gas, and I uh, got to charge you a three dollar deposit for the can. Uh, 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 just give me the 270. I trust you. You got an honest face. Well, thank you. I can't tell you how wonderful you make me feel. I'm a minister. And to meet a man who uh, truly lives the word. God bless you. Well, <laughs> thank you, Reverend. I walk back to the car. I make a U turn. I tingle all over. I know now that I am accepting the truth. And I shall be truly committed. In a few minutes, I see exactly what I'm looking for. I turn off the highway and I drive slowly, cautiously, because it's the most deserted part of town. Still, I must take no chances. I pull up in front of the building. A large, rambling two-story warehouse made of wood, ramshackle, old, obviously deserted. I move quickly to the rear, carrying the five-gallon can. I have never felt so alive, so vital. I find a broken window. In a moment, I'm inside, and the floor is covered with piles of rags and papers. I pour the gasoline. Soak everything thoroughly. Now, I strike a match, and I feel a shock run through my entire body. There's a burst of flame. I run to the window. I jump clear. On the corner near my car, a firebox. I pull the alarm and I get back into the car. I drive down the block, park in an alleyway where I can watch. By now, the flames from the burning building are shooting up to the sky. And here they come, the engines. The engines, the gleaming red engines. The crowd begins to gather. Where do they come from? Why do they want to watch? Are they like me? Oh, it's so warm, so pleasant, so relaxing. There's nothing like this. Nothing in the world. (laughs) 
I thought I'd wait up for you last night, Dell, and I fell asleep. Uh, what time did you finally get home? Oh, it must have been close to three, Rhoda. Where were you? I tried to reach you at Frank O'Malley. I never got there. I was on the Pleasantville Road, and I stopped at a diner. Oh, P- Porgies? I remembered I was supposed to see Frank next week. As long as I was out that way, I decided to uh, drop in on Joe Stevens. Well, that's 40 miles further up the road. Oh, I just thought I'd surprise him, but there was no one home. Oh, that whole drive for nothing. And then on the way back, I had a flat. <laughs> I guess it just wasn't your night. No, it wouldn't have been so bad, except that I didn't have that, uh... Oh, you know, the thing you need to change the tire? Uh, you, you mean the jack? No, no, the, the lug wrench, you know. There it was, pitch dark, miles from anywhere, and I'm trying to flag down cars. Oh, poor Dell. Anyway, finally somebody stopped, and I was able to change the tire. Oh, what a night. Why did you try to reach me at Frank O'Malley's? Oh, I didn't have a moment's peace last night. As I said, that phone wouldn't stop ringing. Well, couldn't you tell people it was my night off? I mean, everyone's entitled to a night off. Oh, yes, dear, everyone but you. Evidently, you're not supposed to have one. Why? Because you're the fire chief. he does for a living. Well, you must admit he has the strangest hobby for a man in his position. Yes, and you must also admit you meet a most colorful crop of strange characters here. But this is only the first act. Give our characters a chance to ripen in act two, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. Obviously, what we're concerned with here is what might be called the double life of Delbert Casserole. We've shown you Delbert on his day off, away from home, relaxing, enjoying himself. Now we would like to show you the serious workaday Delbert as an important member and a concerned citizen of his community. Good morning. I'm Jerry Behagen, and this is the program where you meet the people who make the world go round. Today's guest is a man you never think about until you need him. But when you do need him, you simply can't think of anyone else. He is fireman. Actually, he's the fire chief of Caswell's Corners, Delbert Casserole. Well, how are you this morning, Chief Casserole? Just fine, Jerry. Just fine. The chief has a most unique distinction. Caswell Corners has the lowest number of fires per capita of any community in the United States. How do you account for that, Chief? Well, I guess it's because... Well, we'll find out in just a few moments. First, I have some fascinating news for all our viewers. Andy, this is Rhoda Casserole. Oh, fine. Uh, Did Eddie tell you I left the car at the garage this morning after I dropped Dell off at the TV station? He's being interviewed. Look, the commercials are on now, so just let me tell you quickly. He had a flat late last night... So I guess the tire had better be fixed. He never thinks of those things. He just puts on the spare and throws the flat tire in the trunk. Andy, can you have it by noon? Oh, great. Thanks a lot. I have to get back to the show. Now, Chief, uh, according to the records, there wasn't a single residential or commercial fire in Caswell Corners during the past year. That's correct. Well, how, how do you count for it? Prevention, Jerry. Very strict. Comprehensive system of prevention. Oh, well, can you explain that? Well, unless you're dealing with an act of God, and that doesn't occur too often, you get a fire because A, someone was careless, B, someone's violating a rule, or C, a combination of both. As for how about D, those people who deliberately start fires, uh, arsonists? Well, there you have unfortunate sick people. And there's nothing a fire department can do about them. They belong to the psychiatrists. Yes, well, I raise the point, Chief, because not too far from here, over in Dawson County, there was a fire late last night that was definitely of suspicious origin, according to the authorities. Yes, I read about that in the morning paper. Now, a huge old deserted warehouse. You know, six firemen were injured, and three rather seriously. Mm. Now, what should be done to people, to arsonists who do... Jerry, I feel too strongly about it to be quoted on the air, frankly. The only words that I could possibly use would have to be censored. Yes, well, now about your program of prevention. Yes. Well, now we have... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I must interrupt again. We'll be right back with Chief Casserole. But first... And now, before we return to Chief Casserole, a message of fantastic importance. Are you the manager here? Yeah. 
Lieutenant Stacy, homicide. Well, what can I do for you, Lieutenant? Uh, first, you can turn off that set. Uh, oh. You uh, want to ask about that girl that was murdered here last night, huh? I already talked to other cops. I don't know nothing. Believe me, nothing. You never saw the girl before? Nope. And when I tell you I don't know nothing, it ain't because I don't happen to know nothing. With me, it's deliberate. The man who was with her. I'm the kind of business where if you don't know nothing, you're better off. The man? i never seen him before, either. He signs the register, John Smith. Did he show any uh, identification? He paid cash. He didn't have to. Well, can you describe him? Uh, tall, thin, kind of whitish blonde hair. Mm-hmm. Dressed? A blue sport jacket, gray pants. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, wait, 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 wait a minute. He uh, looks familiar. Well, if you never saw him before, why should he look familiar? Uh, uh, why should he look familiar? Uh, let me think. <laughs> You were about to tell us there are practically no fires in Castle Corners, Chief. Well, we have a program of rigid inspection, Jerry, for all commercial and industrial buildings. Yes. And a very comprehensive safety program in the schools. I see. Prevention, Jerry, that's the key word. Well, this may be a silly question, but doesn't it get boring? I mean, here are all you firemen sitting around the firehouse, and you never get to go to a fire. Yes, this is Mrs. Casserole. Oh, Andy. Yes? What's that? What do you mean, which tire do I want you to fix? The one that has the flat in it. But that's impossible. Delbert said he had a flat... Oh. Well, I... I, 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 Well, maybe I made a mistake. I'll be by to pick up the car. this guy look familiar? I, uh, I know I seen him someplace, Lieutenant. Where? Oh, it'll come to me. <laughs> Crazy. It's on the tip of my tongue. A tall, kind of slender guy with whitish blonde hair. Uh, make that uh, grayish blonde. That's funny. Yeah? What's funny, Lieutenant? Sounds like a guy I think I saw myself. Where? Uh, you say you seen this guy too, Lieutenant? Uh, now, look. You keep thinking. And when you remember where you saw him... Call headquarters. We were asking Chief Delbert Casserole if life didn't get boring around the firehouse. Well, Chief, does it? Oh, no, no, not a bit. Well, don't you miss the excitement of racing down the streets full speed? You know, with the sirens screaming, the bells clanging? No, no. And and the thrill of conquering the fire itself, of subduing the flames, the uh, adventure of rescuing trapped people from burning buildings. No, no, no. No, the greatest excitement a fireman can experience, Jerry, is the quiet excitement of sitting in the firehouse and knowing that all is well, all is safe in the city. I'm Lieutenant Stacy Homicide. No, it's Homicide. Look, I told the other cops I... Wait, what are the cops? The arson cops. What arson cops? Oh, they had this fire last night. I don't know if I'm in a gym or not. Which fire? Over in Southland. The old Magruder warehouse went up like a Roman candle. Well, that's not what I'm here for. I'm looking for a guy who might have stopped off to buy gasoline here. He spent the night at Plum's Motel down the line. Well, how would I know? He was a tall, thin guy with whitish blonde hair. He could have worn a... A blue uh... sport jacket with gray pants. Yes, that's the one. Tell me about him. What make car was he driving? I don't know. This guy said he was a preacher. How could he have been a preacher? Well, anyhow, he says he run out of gas. So I fill him up a five-gallon can. And he got such an honest face, I don't even ask him a deposit till like that. Uh, keep telling me about him. What can I tell you? Next I know, the arson cops are here. This can, this five-gallon can of gas, turns up, guess where? In the burnt-out ruins of the warehouse. Were they sure it was the same can? Oh, yeah. It was kind of twisted out of shape by the flames and all. But you could read where I scratched my name on it, Paul's service station. Uh, this tall, whitish, blonde-haired guy with the blue sports jacket and gray pants. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's him. You mean he done something else last night? Chief Castro, now, in conclusion, do you have any parting words for our audience? Well, Jerry, I'd just like to say that fire can be the most tragic loss of all... Because it's the most needless. Well, thank you, Chief. 
Folks, our guest this morning has been Chief Delbert Casserol of the Casserol Corners Fire Department. A fireman who very rarely gets a chance to go to a fire. Rhoda, I'm home. Yes. Did you catch the show? Uh, yes. Well, how'd I do? Well, I mean, people I, kept calling I, me office all day. You know what they said? They said I look sensational. What did you think? Uh, well, what did I think? I, about what? Oh, what about the show? How did I come over? Oh, uh, very nice. Very nice? Is that all? I mean, people kept calling all day. They said I was a born TV personality. Hey, let me get that. Hello? Oh, Frank, yeah. Oh, you saw it, huh? <laughs> sure. Ah, oh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Frank. That, uh, that was Mayor Frank Countenborn himself. Said the show was absolutely the greatest. How come you, uh, you thought it was just nice? Well, it, it was all right. Well, what was wrong? What do you mean, wrong? I mean, why didn't you like it? Well, I didn't say I didn't like it. I wrote it. Something's bothering you. Now, what is it? Oh, I, I don't know. Now, something's bothering you. Look, Rhoda, we've always been absolutely honest with each other, haven't we? Have we? What are you saying? Delbert, at first I didn't know if I should bring this up. Then I knew if I didn't, it would just fester and grow bigger and uglier. What are you driving at? Let me finish. It's hard enough. And now that I've decided to do it, I don't know how to put it. Will you get to the point for crying out loud? I'm not sure what the point is. Bill, we decided when we got married that each of us would have a night alone. Well? Friday. Well, I never really go anywhere Friday. I sit home and read. Or I relax. Or I might watch TV. Rhoda, where is all this headed? Where do you go, Delbert? I know we're supposed to respect each other's privacy, but where do you go? Where, for instance, did you go last night? Last night? Why did you say you came home late because you had a flat tire? Why? You said you had to wait hours to flag down a motorist to borrow a lug wrench. But we have one in the trunk. I looked. Well, I, I might have kept this guy's by mistake. No. It's ours. Anyway, you didn't have a flat tire. Andy at the garage told me all the tires were okay. The same spare he sold us was in the well. Dell, look at me. Where do you go on Friday nights? Where do I go? Where were you last night? I don't know. And what did you do last night? I don't know. Tell me, Dell. Tell me. I don't know, Rhoda. I swear to you, I don't know. That's an answer. He either does or he doesn't know. We, however, do know. And the portrait of Chief Delbert Casserole slowly but surely begins to emerge. A little fire seems to have started in the chief's own house. And we'll see if it can be put out in the third act. It is accurate, if somewhat redundant to say that an honest relationship between a man and a woman must be based on the truth. However, how many relationships are truly honest? And how many people could actually tolerate them? And so, people make little adjustments to keep peace and harmony. But sooner or later... Do you mean you have no idea where you go on Friday night? Rhoda, please, don't keep... Don't keep what? Prying, probing. All right. Tell me it's none of my business. Tell me you have a right to a secret. Tell me anything at all, Del, but don't tell me you don't know. It's the truth. And you don't know where you were last night either? I've already told you that. And the story of the tire, the flat tire. That was a lie. All right, it was a lie. Why? Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd give you a reason why I was so late. Well, where were you last You're night? You're beginning to sound like a broken record. Well, where I don't know where I was. There are some things we'll never know. There are mysteries. Dale, I want you to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor. Golden says there's nothing wrong with me. You know the kind of doctor I mean. No. 
Why not? You know why not. I can't afford it. You have to go. A man who holds public office the way I do cannot afford to go to a psychiatrist. Period. And we're not going to discuss it either. If we're not going to discuss this, we're not going to discuss anything, anything at all. We'll have no relationship of any kind. We'll never even see each other because I will get a divorce. Rhoda. There's something wrong with you, Dell. We don't have very much of a life together as it is. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Well, look, I... I, I, I get home late. I mean, there, there, there's so much to do. I'm, I'm, I'm so tired. I... That's why you have to see a psychiatrist. Rhoda, honey, please. Please. Give me a chance to work my own way out of this, will you? Still, you need a doctor. Now, look, Rhoda, I'll, I'll get home earlier. I'll even cut out the Friday nights altogether, all right? We'll, we'll try to work it out together. Come on, Rhoda, please. Let, let's at least try. Was she going with anybody? No. I never seen her with a man. How uh, about friends? Uh, no, not so many friends. Uh, last night, here in the restaurant... Oh, she had lots of moods. You know moods? Women, they, they, they have moods. Uh, did anyone pick her up after I was always in the kitchen. I could never figure her out. Did she say anything about where she was going? I don't know. My brother and his wife, they're both dead now. They brought her here from Russia. She was a baby. I know her all my life. Did you see anyone who might have gone a up? quiet girl, kept to herself, stays home in her little apartment. They find her dead in a motel room. Why? How? Does she have some secret life I know nothing about? Uh, last night in this restaurant, did you notice a tall, thin man with blondish white hair and a blue jacket with gray slacks? Did I notice? Why, of course. Of course. Why didn't you ask me in the first place? Of course. The place was crowded last night. The biggest crowd in, in a long time. So ask me, how would I remember a man? Okay, okay, how? Because he was a single. He came in here alone. Most people, they come couples, a party of four, a party of six, you understand? But him, he was the only single all night. Where would you have seated him? Over there, in that small little table. And did Anya Petrov wait on him? Sure, why not? It was our station. Have you ever seen him before? No. Well, did Anya ever speak of anyone who uh, may have looked like him? I told you, she never talked about anybody. Uh, all right, all right. This, this person, this, this man, do you think he's the one who... Thank you for your help. <laughs> Homicide, Lieutenant Stacy speaking. Lieutenant, uh, this is Marvin Plum, uh, Plum's Motel. Uh, oh, yes, yes, Mr. Plum. You said I was to call if I ever remembered where I'd seen that guy before. Uh, you know, the one who... Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Plum. Well, Lieutenant, what's the hardest thing in the world to find? I don't know. Something that's been right under your nose all along. Uh, about the man... Yes, yes, sir. The thing, it wasn't where I'd seen him before. That's what threw me. I'd never seen him before. Uh, then why did you say you'd seen him before? It was where I'd seen him since. Since? Since the murder. But the murder had only taken place the night before. This was the next morning. Now, where would you have seen him since? He was right in front of my eyes. Where? He'd have been right in front of your eyes, too, if you'd have been facing the TV set. He was on the program. Who? This guy who is a dead ringer for the one you're looking for. The guy who checked into the motel. The guy who killed the waitress. Who? It's got to be his double or his twin brother. He was on the show. He's the guy, the fire chief over at Caswell's Corners. You haven't touched your dinner, Del. I'm not hungry. But you should eat something. But I am not hungry. Delbert, this is exactly what we talked about. You have to lead a more calm, a more relaxed, a less pressure-filled life. Okay, I'll try. Darling, I'm trying to help you. I know, I know. Oh, I still think you should see a psychiatrist. Let's not talk about it right now. But when should we talk about it? Tomorrow. Now I have to go out. Where? Where? It's Friday night. We never ask each other about Friday night. Wait a minute, Dell. We agreed there would be no more Friday nights. When did we agree? Last week. Don't you remember? 
Well, I, I, I just thought I'd go out for a drive and relax and have a few drinks. No, Dell. No, you're going to stay home and relax from now on. Rhoda, we agreed when we got married that... Dell, you're in trouble. You won't let a psychiatrist help you, and if you won't let me help you, I'll walk out. No, Rhoda, no. Now, we're going to spend a quiet, relaxing evening at home. <laughs> Homicide, Lieutenant Stacy. Oh, yes, I know, Inspector. Yes, it's a bad time for the department. Uh, the waitress killing, the arson. But well, I'm doing the best I can, sir. No, no, I, I don't, don't have a thing. But uh, no, no, okay, okay, maybe I do. But it's so far out. I, I mean, I could have a suspect. No, but it, it's impossible. It just simply couldn't be this guy. No, no, I won't tell you who he is either, because you'll drop me off at the nut house. What do you want me to do? Go to the public library. Ye yes. And read what? A story about Sherlock Holmes called The Sign of the Four? And now, Inspector, is this a gag? Oh, well, yes, sir. Yes, sir, if it's an order. Now, darling, isn't this pleasant? Yeah, I just, uh... You just what? No, I'm just not used to being home on a Friday night, that's all. Why? Why do you find it so necessary to go out? I don't know. Well, try to think. There is something lacking in our relationship that you have to find it elsewhere. Is something lacking? Well? Yes. You know what it is. Delbert, I'm willing to be patient. And perhaps if both of us try... No, Rhoda, it isn't that. Why do you women always think that? That it has to do with... With... Then what else is lacking? It's something that... Yes? And well, I think he said it. Who said the it? The one on the program, that Jerry, whatever his name is, he said it. Well, what did he say? I can hear him. I can hear exactly how he said it. Doesn't... Doesn't it ever get boring? I mean, here are all you firemen sitting around the firehouse and you'd never get to go to a fire. Now, don't you miss the excitement of racing down the street, sirens screaming? Bells clanging and the thrill of conquering the fire itself, of subduing the flames, the adventure? But I also heard what you answered, Dell. The greatest excitement a fireman can experience is the quiet excitement of sitting in the firehouse and knowing that all is well, all is safe in the city. If I said that, I lied. Dell! Because I miss it. I miss it. I need it. What? What do you need? The fire. What fire? The fire. Fire! The fire shooting up into the sky. The searing flames, the billowing smoke. The shots of the firemen, the police, the crowds. And the flames. Ooh, those flames. Have you ever seen the rest of the street, the other houses? How the shadows play over them, the shadows of the leaping flames? And you can almost feel those houses and buildings shudder and moan with fear and dread and apprehension. Shall they be destroyed or shall they be saved? Del, don't say any more. Just sit here with me. Let me put my arms around you. No, that won't help. She tried that. They all try that. It's the same as it is with you. It's no good. A doctor. Dell, you'll have to see a doctor. No. A fire. I want to see a fire. You know, you never see a fire in this town. And it's my fault. Because I'm too good a fire chief. That's why we have no fires. Because I'm too smart, too conscientious. I'm being cheated. Let me go get you something. I need a fire. That's what I need. You understand? A fire. Any fire. In here. Where's my cigarette lighter? No. You see, I light up this pile of newspapers. Delbert! Ah, yes, and I'll scatter them around the room. Oh, Delbert. we're going to have a fire in here. We're going to have a real fire. No! No, don't! Shut up! Delbert, Delbert, let, let go of me! I want me. you to stay here with me and watch it. Watch the beautiful flames. Let go! A new no. experience for you. I've watched so many fires from the outside. Now we shall see one from the inside. Just the two of us. No. Shut up. We'll be burned to death. I said be quiet. Yes, you're joking me. Good Lord, it is you. What are you doing in my house? Who let you in? It's you, the white-haired guy. You're a maniac. Let go of her. Let me out. No. Let's get out of here. Let's go of her before we all get killed. This place is going up. Now let go. Oh, the house. Oh, it's in flames. Take it easy, ma'am. Take it easy. Oh. 
Oh, I remember now. My husband's in there. I'm sorry. I was able to get you out. I was not able to make it back for him. He, he tried to kill me. Oh, why? I, I don't know. I don't know. I thought I'd come here on a fool's errand. I, I guess the inspector was right. He set fire to the house. Oh, I can't believe he'd do such a thing. Neither would anybody else, ma'am. Neither would anybody else. Oh, but it's, it's impossible. Impossible. Yes, that reminds me. I... I have to make a call. I guess you were right, Inspector. What it said in that book. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. What is the impossible? Is it something that cannot happen under any conditions? Or is it something that we believe cannot happen? The longer we live, the less firm we are in our beliefs about the impossible. Soon, who knows, that very word impossible shall disappear from our language. But I won't disappear. I shall return shortly. What was it we asked at the very beginning? Oh, yes. Are we what we love, or are we what we hate? Or are we a mixture of each? Is each of us a formula of highly volatile chemical properties which can explode suddenly, violently, unpredictably? Yes, it is an unpredictable world. And the only certainty you can cling to is the knowledge that we at least shall be here seven nights each week. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Joan Shea, Earl Hammond, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Tonight I couldn't get to sleep. I... I, I couldn't relax. So I decided to come over here and tell you. I know it's a terrible thing to face, but at least it's the truth. Yes, I know. And, Matt, I appreciate it. I really do. I always want to know the truth. I always have, Matt. You, you know that. But it isn't the kind of thing you want to tell a patient, any patient. But when the patient is an old friend like you, then it's a hundred times as hard. It's damn near impossible. But, I mean, it tears you apart. Matt. Matt, don't upset yourself. You see, I've, uh... I've known this for quite a while. Oh, you couldn't But have. I did. Believe me, I did. I, I may die tomorrow. I know that. Tonight, maybe. Dave. Now, you just just run along home and get some sleep. You did the right thing. Tell me about the aneurysm. You just backed me up on what I knew already. Now, you just run along home and don't worry about a thing. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy in the YouTube search bar. Till then, 